Paul Tebow was born to an alcoholic parent, worked from the age of six to help his family pay the bills, failed second grade, was a high school dropout, and became a homeless drug dealer in East Palo Alto. At the age of 23, everything changed. He's now pursuing a PhD in education. In 2009, Paul founded 10 Books a Home, a nonprofit with the aim of altering educational and life outcomes for the most impoverished children in the Bay Area. It works with families of preschoolers for one hour per week for two years. The organization has some impressive data showing that its graduates are performing far better than their peers who are not enrolled in the program. Paul, let's start when you were a little kid. You had an alcoholic parent. You became homeless. Doesn't sound like a great life to me. Were you depressed? No. Um, my mom, for sure, all of her flaws, all of her, her, her gaps in parenting, um, she loved me. Um, and I, I credit that with partly why I'm such an optimistic person. What about your school? Um, I gather early schooling was not your, it left something to be desired. Yeah, um, I, one thing that, that my parents instilled in me from an early age was work. Uh, I was working from the time I was six, and doing, collecting cans, um, changing diapers for my mom's daycare, um, doing chores. Um, doing a paper route that I didn't even know my mom was being paid for. Um, so one of the things I think they gave me from a really early age was 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 a work ethic, um, and that ethic was um, work to work, uh, find the pleasure in work. And mm. um, I think that 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 is what saved me uh, or brought me back from the homelessness and the drugs and the gangs and the jail and all the things that ensued in my, uh, in my mm. adolescence, in my teens. Well, now, with respect to school, you had an interesting experience where you changed schools and the difference between the two schools um, changed you or helped you out and in a way that influenced what you do now. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, well, when I was, when I was, uh, what, what, what age was I? 14 uh, was when I dropped out of school. Um, and um, I really didn't have direction. So I just uh, actually fell into the streets of East Palo Alto. Um, just kind of landed there. And um, I found uh, that uh, there was a lot of, of people that I enjoyed having friendships with. And we, we ran the streets, we started, I got in drugs, um, but um, about, uh, about four or five years later, um, there's a guy that was running with us who came from a college-educated family, and he offered a book to me. And that was kind of when my real education started, when I was 23, and I read my first book ever. Yeah, tell me about that and what that did to you. Yeah, um, well, so I, I knew what poverty was like to, to live in, and of course, I didn't know it on the level that a lot of my friends knew it on. Um, I wasn't raised in a crack house. But um, uh, I had never actually conceptualized poverty. I never thought about poverty before. And when I read Malcolm X's autobiography, I literally shuddered at thinking about this phenomena of poverty that I experienced, but that was everywhere and it it just turned on something in me that made me want to keep learning and mm. it was from that moment that i began to get my education so one book you read one book and it changed everything seven pages actually by the time i got to the seventh page of that book wow. and realized that i was still reading that book i i knew something was wrong <laughs> Or right. <laughs> uh, you also said that you started asking questions. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, well, in step with, with starting to read, um, I fell into writing as well. And so um, what I started doing was um, doing five-minute free writes every day. 
and I would make myself just write for five minutes without stopping. And once that felt comfortable, then I would increase it to 10 minutes and then 15 and 20. And before I knew it, um, I would sometimes sit for, for you know, six to eight hours and just write. Uh, and one of the techniques that I used was uh, what I would later find out is called the Socratic method. I would just do question trees. And I just ask myself question after question after question because when you're 23 years old and you've just read your first book, you got a lot to catch up on. So um, writing became a huge, huge means for me to start introspecting and asking questions was a way to actually accelerate my kind of getting to know Paul and, and uh, what, what he had missed out on in the last 23 years in, in terms of development. So, so you were on an education, a self-education yeah. role. Uh, presumably you gave up the drug dealing? Yeah, so um, it was... It was very much um, instinctual, if you will. Um, once I started reading and once I started writing, um, I quickly realized uh, I was on, on, on route to die by murder or go to prison. Um, I was hanging with uh, not the right crowd. So um, I decided that I was going to uh, take up and go to college. So I... Um, um, left a hotel room one night with a, with a guy who had warrants in about five states, waving his gun around and knocking off about $20,000 of special K, it's ketamine, it's a tranquilizer, off of the table and wasn't sure if I was going to walk out, but I had to go. And so I left and I uh, went to college. Wow. Can you compare your, your two jobs, your jobs then and your job now? Or are there any similarities uh, or not between your work ethic that you brought to drug dealing sure. and what you're doing now, which yeah. seems totally different. I'm but. uncertain whether this is going to hurt our uh, donations this year, but uh, there is a huge, huge similarity to um, having customers of your product and having customers of your nonprofit. Um, the more passionate you are about what you do, uh, the more happy people are about discussing your, your product or in 10 books of home, your service. And uh, I bring that same passion to uh, children and education that I did to, uh, to drugs. Um, and what, I, what I've realized over the last 10 years, um, and I say it to myself almost every day, is, you know, I used to sell drugs in East Palo Alto. Now I sell education. Um, and I, I'm, I feel proud that I could make that transition and still apply something that I had learned to doing something good and positive with my life. Tell me about the program then. What is the basic philosophy and how does it work? So 10 Books at Home um, is based on what's called intrinsic learning motivation. And before I mention that, we work with preschoolers. So kids that are ages three until they are five, so for two years. And we work in their homes and we work with their parents and because we're in their homes, their families are involved. So we are very much a home-based, family-centered program. Mm -hmm. And we send over tutors, volunteer tutors, once a week for one hour for two years. And we support those tutors with what's called the ILM method, so Intrinsic Learning Motivation Method. And all ILM means is the drive to learn for the sake of learning. It's what happened to me when I read that first book. I started learning for the sake of learning. And what we do is we teach our volunteer uh, role models and the parents who, are part, who participate in the lessons. We teach them how to cultivate the intrinsic motivations of the preschoolers. That sounds like a tall order. It sounds difficult, especially when you have apathetic kids, yeah. bored kids. Uh, you have or found an incredible drive and motivation, but I bet a lot of people out there, it doesn't come so easily. Yeah. Um, it seems tall in the face of how we currently educate our children, which very, very high level is by forcing them to learn. We decide these are the learning benchmarks and I need you to meet them by the end of the quarter or the end of the year. And the teacher's responsibility is to figure out how to get them to achieve those benchmarks. Um, we do something completely opposite. We sit down and we figure out what you like. 
And once you tap into what drives a person to want to learn, they begin to learn for the sake of it. They begin to spend their own time learning. And so kind of counterintuitively, it's actually pretty simple once you identify what they like. And is it easy to identify what they like? Yeah. Three-year-olds are, three are so in search of learning. Um, what's interesting is when you start grade school, um, what's called intrinsic, motiv or intrinsic motivation, um, th that research has been around for about 50 years. Um, and basically intrinsic motivation is where you do things just for the sake of doing them. Um, between the grades of first grade and high school, intrinsic motivation continuously falls. But before then, children are very, very motivated. And so we're actually capitalizing on, on what almost every single three-year-old has in them and is waiting to cultivate, which is um, a motivation to learn about something. Hmm. How are you different from other programs? That uh, This doesn't sound that new to me. I, I've heard a lot of people saying, follow the child's interest. Mm -hmm. How is what you do different? Yeah, um, so you might compare us to Montessori or to play-based learning or Regio Milia. Um, and those are all really awesome teaching or educational methods. Um, but they stop short of delimiting curriculum, or in other words, letting children learn anything they want. So where ILM method takes the next step is in saying, we're not going to actually have any benchmarks for you. You are going to be the creator of your benchmarks. And there's a cool term, it's called, called autotelic. And it was coined by Mahali, Six Cent Mahali, um, using the term flow. Mm -hmm. And basically when you're in a state of flow, um, all of your concentration and your attention is devoted and you pretty much are operating at maximum brain power. And we, um, in order for a child to operate at maximum brain power, what you want to do is you want to let you want to let them choose what they're going to learn next and then introduce to them a goal that they might think is challenging and fun to achieve and then another and another and so another. you do have benchmarks and goals it's just that you make them up as you go along the children make them up yes so the children are making the benchmarks for themselves are there any kids who make up benchmarks that either you or the parents or somebody says nah nah Oh, all the time, because um, as adults, most of us were, were force-fed what we learned and taught that, you know, you need to go to school, you need to go to college, you need to get a good job, yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Um, so we are continuously battling with um, helping the adults to, instead of focusing on how children perform, focus on what they want to learn. Well, suppose I'm a kid and I just want to sit here and twiddle my thumbs. Oh, that would never happen. Um, you would want to, let me give you an example. Her name's Sol, and she started the program. Um, the second week in the program, she was doing an eight-piece puzzle, uh, one of those really big, big pieces in the puzzle. Fifteen weeks later, um, after bringing puzzle after puzzle after puzzle after puzzle, she was solving 100-piece puzzles in 35 minutes. And there's a girl that came in um, not speaking any English, not being in preschool, um, but had a desire to problem solve. And once we were able to tap that, she began to show us what she wanted to do, and we began to supply those learning opportunities. So you've never met kids who don't show you anything? Uh, never. And, and what we'll do is we're going to show up with, with a whole bag of mm -hmm. different activities. So we'll bring measuring tape, Play-Doh, scissors, tape. Kids love tape. Um, and give them the options to begin with and kind of see kind of where do they go. Do they kind of gravitate toward puppets and doing pretend play? Or do they gravitate toward writing? What is it that kind of piques their interest? And then from there we begin to introduce more complicated learning goals for them. When you talk about we mm -hmm. and learning goals, this does sound like a skill. And you are imparting a skill set largely to the parents. That not that a, kind of a tall order? Isn't this about uh, educating the parents as much or more than educating the kids? Uh, it's certainly about involving parents in their children's learning. Um, and it's mostly about empowering the parents to see how powerful learning is 
And there's no better way to, quote unquote, educate a parent about why they should be invested in their child's education than to show them what their own child is capable of. So as parents progress through the program, they become very, very engaged and involved because not only are, is, are we providing the resources for their child to learn, but we're, they're also, we're leaving those resources with them at the end of each party every week. And then they are able to then use and engage and interact with their children from week to week and in a, in a very organic way begin to develop that habit of being involved with their child's learning. Now, this, re this does require a, a real leap of faith because presumably there are short-term failures that are, are sacrifices um, in the name of, of long-term. It must take a while to get this working. Uh, is that a, a challenge ever, a problem? Uh, so you're talking to a guy that hadn't heard of economics and majored in it. So you're talking to a guy that hadn't heard of a nonprofit and filled out a form, uh, basically a 501c3. You're talking to a guy that hadn't even heard of early education when he had actually designed the program for preschoolers. So for me, uh, all, all newness, all challenges are just opportunities to... to to, to see and seize what might blur other people's vision. Um, what, what, what failures have you seen? Yeah, have you seen absolutely. parents not buy in? Well, I, I don't believe in failure. Um, but in terms of parents and, and even volunteers, yes, um, we have seen parents not buy in. <clears throat> um, in large part, though, um, I don't think we've seen them buy in because we haven't mastered how to teach ILM method. Um, this is something that I did as a, as a private tutor on my own time and then began to figure out and incorporate and operationalize uh, through nonprofit. And so largely our ability to have parents see and believe in what we do is, is based on our ability to really teach them the method. And, and that as a young organization is something that I uh, freely say we're still doing. So when we see parents who will, uh, we have parents that will drop out. We have about a 10% attrition rate. Mm -hmm. um, so about 10% of families will drop out of our program in the course of a year. Um, about 5% of those are because families can't afford to live here in, in, in East Palo Alto or East Menlo Park anymore. It's just getting too expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other 5% are dropping out because, yeah, they say, you know what, I got a job, so uh, I don't have time for the program anymore. Or um, my, my kid started soccer, and so it interferes with, the, with, your, with your learning party time, so we want to drop. So, yeah, we, we definitely face failure every day. Tell me about some of your um, statistics, your mm -hmm. stunning statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and also tell me, does that come from the fact that you might be attracting the most motivated people? Is that skewing your, your results? Absolutely. I um, <clears throat> anecdotally have always known that we are not attracting the most uh, likely to succeed. I remember one day, um, it hasn't happened actually since that day, but um, right in the first year we were offering the learning parties, um, we showed up and there were clouds of smoke in the home. And the parents just smoked marijuana. And we did the party and had the party. And after the party, you know, I, I said to them, hey, hey, you know, I, we're in your house, so you're going to do what you want to do. Uh, but would you be okay with, you know, not doing it before we come over for a party? Um, and sure enough, it never, ever happened again. Um, that was, you know, uh, anecdotally a, uh, a time when I saw uh, that we certainly weren't having the, the what's called self-serving mm -hmm. um, families um, enrolling in the program. But we just actually um, launched a one-year study, mm -hmm. and it's looking at uh, children when they enter the program and then how they do over the first year of the program. And what are the results? And um, well, what we, what we saw is um, about 83% of kids that mm -hmm. are starting our program are three months developmentally delayed. You mean when they start? When they start. So, so you're not picking the best and the brightest. The as it children were. who are coming into our program are three months behind where they should be, according to national, um, national tests or national assessments in literacy, in numeracy, and, and vocabulary. Where are they when they leave? So the study is still in motion. Um, we are about to actually get the six-month uh, benchmark, but we'll be releasing those results in September at our, um, at our gala. 
Um, what I can tell you is when children do graduate, uh, we continue to track their academic achievement. So they graduate when they start kindergarten. And we've had four years of children graduate already. And as of this last year, um, 47, per, um, excuse me, our, our, our graduates are outperforming 47% of California students in math and 10% wow. of California students in reading. Wow. You put a lot into this. Do you get anything out of it? Have you learned anything from it? Has it changed you? So we have this, this uh, tool. It's called the ILM wheel. And it basically has different um, attributes like letters, numbers, colors, shapes. And we teach our role models and parents how to use it to talk more with the kids about information that the, that the kids might not be likely to know. And I have been using that for uh, three years now. And uh, one of the changes that's literally happened in me is I see colors that I never used to see. Because when you're with a kid at three, there everything is a color. So you're pointing out, this is purple, this is blue, this is black. And um, I literally, while I am outside, I actually see colors that I did not used to see. You mean more shades of the same, more, more subtleties? Yeah, more shades. You could see, just as an example, when I look up at the sky, I could really see how the blue will move from lighter to darker. And, and that's not something that I, I ever noticed. So this is just you stepping into the child's role. That is right. Yes, yeah, wow, cool. starting to see what, what kids are seeing, taking myself back in time. Uh -huh. Big picture, uh, are there applications outside of preschool and in the future? Absolutely. Um, a new mass education system. Um, my, my vision is that children on Friday are ticked off because they have to go home from school and can't wait to get back on Monday. I love it. That's a benchmark that we can measure. So we'll come back in 10 years from now and, and, and check on those, those kids coming out of school. Thank you very much for all this. Congratulations on your award. Thank you so much. Do you know someone who has overcome significant hardship and has an inspiring story to tell? Someone who has sacrificed or given over and above to the community and deserves some recognition? If so, please contact us with your nomination for next year's Local Hero Awards. To find out more about our local heroes and to watch interviews with all the winners, visit our website, midpenmedia.org. At the Midpen Community Media Center, you can make your own videos and television programs and take classes in all aspects of media production. You can also hire our professional services team. To find out more about that, go to mcproservices.com. Congratulations to all our winners, and thank you for watching.